Uh, good evening. I'm Larry Ball, the program chair for Applied Economics. Uh, glad to see everybody for the spring 2016 Summerlin lecture. Uh, we're grateful, as always, to Mark Summerlin for sponsoring this great uh, event. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Olivier Blanchard, who probably for this audience doesn't need too much introduction. Um, he was a longtime professor at MIT. In his misspent youth, he was my dissertation advisor. Uh, he was uh, Chris, Chris Carroll's dissertation advisor, uh, lot, many people's dissertation advisors uh, in many generations. Um, and then he decided just to, uh, on a lark to get a little bit involved in policymaking and became the chief economist at the IMF and happened to arrive in September 2008. Uh, so if he was hoping this would be sort of a nice, comfortable sinecure, uh, uh, and he was there until 2015, and the, the world economy has improved from 2008 to 2015. But I think maybe more directly, the, the IMF uh, Research Department has uh, really got a tremendous reputation. Um, as a, a practical tip, if you, if you want sort of good applied uh, research, look at the uh, World Economic Outlook, which comes, comes out uh, twice a year. It's really sort of a, I think a flagship for the whole world of sophisticated, policy-oriented uh, research. Um, but I could go on, but I'll, I'll let Olivier go on instead. I'm glad to have you. Good. Well, thank you, Larry, uh, for your kind remarks. Thank you, Mark, for being behind this event. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I went to the font, uh, basically I arrived two weeks before Lehman, not have, having no clue as to what was uh, waiting for me. And I had to give my, I was just telling Larry, I, I gave my first press conference the day after Lehman. It had been scheduled that way. And, uh, you know, when you're the chief economist of a font, you're supposed to know everything and answer every question and, uh, and reassure the world. Uh, I was a bit short of the knowledge I needed, uh, and so I spent, the press conference was at 10 in the morning, and from 8 to 10, I was basically on Google, looking at, <laughs> looking at Wikipedia, what is a CDS? Okay, I think I know that. What is a CDO? Okay, I think I know that. <laughs> and by 10, you know, I knew everything. <laughs> this story I, I, would have been less funny at the time if they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I've learned a lot, and, and that lecture actually is uh, is very much the uh, the result of the uh, of the time I've spent uh, at the font. Why is it called uh, Dark Corners? Uh, because, I mean, first I think the the correct title, which would have probably decreased the audience by half would be non-linearities in macroeconomics. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically what it is about, which is that uh, until the crisis, I think most of us treated the economy as, a, as more or less a linear system. And we know a lot about linear systems are easy to think about. And what we have learned is that there are very strong uh, non-linearities. And uh, again, most of the time, and indeed until uh, 2008, the non-linearities were not essential. They probably had been essential in the past, during the Great Depression, but basically we could ignore them. Uh, but in the crisis, they turned out to be first-order issues, and uh, they, they can complicate life. I mean, basically, linear, sy linear systems are relatively easy to handle. They behave very well if there's a shock, typically goes away over time. Uh, Non-linear systems uh, have uh, strange behavior, so you can have very large multipliers. You basically do a policy intervention and the effect is much bigger than anything you had expected, or it may, may be much smaller, uh, so there's uncertainty about the effects of policy. You can have multiple equilibria, which is uh, for the same configuration of, uh, of shocks, you basically have an economy which behaves and an economy which doesn't, and uh, how you predict which is going to come out turns out to be difficult. So this lecture is very much about that, and that's what I uh, intend to do. Okay. So this is, this is the, the plan for the lecture. Uh, it turns out I think that I'm going to put this on, yes, because I think it's I better, to, it's better to just look at the screen. I hope I know how to use the test. <laughs> 
I'm looking for the uh, push button. Well, given that nobody is helping me, <laughs> I will stick with it's okay. The, so I'm going to proceed in, in three parts. The first one is why is it that we thought of the economy as linear? Why were we so you know, t taken uh, by surprise when it happened? The second is what are the the most obvious non-linearities that we've learned about during the crisis, uh, and they come in uh, with respect to the fiscal position, they come with respect to the financial system. And then the third is, okay, so now that we've learned uh, and we are wiser, what is it that we're going to do in the future, both in terms of research uh, and in terms of policy? So that, that's the plan. Okay. So. What I'm going to argue in this part is that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting history of thought in a way, which is why is it that we convinced ourselves that things were kind of easy to deal with, that the, that the, that the economy was more or less linear. And I think it came from two things. And one is the internal dynamics of a discipline. You use techniques and they force you to, they are useful, but they force you to think about the world in a particular way. Uh, and the second is the external environment, which is that from 1980 to 2008, uh, the world economy and the U.S. economy in particular had basically behaved very nicely. There was a, there was a period called the Great Moderation. Uh, output fluctuations were smaller and smaller, and we thought, okay, so we understand the system. It's kind of, you know, linearity is what is, is going to, to be the kind of structure which delivers this, uh, this, this moderation and therefore looking at the world we didn't see any obvious uh, non-linearities. So let me talk a bit about both. This will be probably more interesting to those of you who are uh, majoring in, in economics, either you know, BA or, or, or PhD or master. Uh, but let me still uh, go through it because it, I think it's interesting. The first thing is that this came, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, there was a very strong push for micro foundations. Macro until then had been very much ad hoc because it was thought to be so hard that you just write down equations which were plausible, but you didn't try to derive them from the corresponding microeconomic course. But there was a strong push in the profession to start with micro foundations. And basically, when you work with more micro foundations, the simplest models are extremely well behaved because you basically put the minimum you need. You don't put distortions, you don't put complicated things because it would become too complex. And therefore, you get models which are not quite linear, but are very well behaved. And very well behaved and linear for me is kind of a, the, the same. The second was uh, something that you may have heard about, which is the introduction of rational expectations. Until then, the assumption had been that expectations were important, but they were formed in some ad hoc way. You saw inflation increase in the past, you expected inflation to continue to increase, a kind of extrapolation. And there was a push, which was a good one, to basically think about expectations being formed in a much more refined way, so that people would take into account events in the future if they thought that this was going to affect uh, outcomes. Now, the problem was that Technically, it's very hard to solve models with rational expectations. And so we made two types of assumptions, which again, we didn't realize uh, were going to bias us in a particular way. But the first one is, how can you form rational expectations? Well, the, the world has to be repetitive in some way, so that by looking at what has happened, you can extrapolate and learn something about the future. So we basically assumed what I call ergodic processes or stationary processes, nicely behaved processes in which we could solve for rational expectations. The second is that to actually literally solve for rational expectation models was, is very difficult to do with nonlinear models. And so there was a strong push for using linear models in which we, did, we developed the techniques to solve on the rational expectations. So again, this was the internal logic of the field. We had new tools that were incredibly powerful, but they also biased us in the direction of thinking about the world as more or less repetitive, nicely behaved, linear, and so on. The second, and again, this is more aimed at those of you who have been dealing with these things, was that we concluded that 
we were not looking at the data in the right way. We were basically looking at the data equation by equation, and we needed to look at stylized facts to just get a sense of what it is that we were trying to explain. And for this, we introduced something called VARs, which are vector autoregressions, which are basically simple equations which explain variables by their past values and shocks. And this was developed by somebody called Chris Sims, who got the Nobel Prize for. And it turned out to be a very nice way of summarizing the data. We could look at the effects of shocks, but all this basically implied that the world was more or less linear. And uh, the way in which we looked at the data, was looking at linear processes representing the data. And again, it was so useful that we made a lot of progress, but the idea of linearity kind of became more and more anchored because this is the technique we were using. So the point is techniques, you know, it's like technological progress. It makes you go ahead in one direction, but at the same time you lose something in the process, and it turns out that what we lost, which is the importance of nonlinearities, uh, is 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 uh, was the case in this case. So that much for history of thought. The the second is the, what I've called uh, what I've called. I'm not sure I'm the one who called it. Maybe I was uh, the Great Moderation. Uh, and the way you see this is with this graph, which is not there, which is not there. Uh, I think this is the change in the, uh, in, the, in the PowerPoint presentation between yesterday and today. <laughs> so now I'm going to use my hands uh, to tell you what the slide which is missing was about. What it did, what it does, is to look at the standard deviation of output growth over time. So how much output growth moves. And basically when you see this graph, which you don't see, uh, it basically goes down from 1980 to 2007, you have a straight decrease in the standard deviation of output growth. Another way of saying this is output became more and more stable around the trend. And it was a very dramatic fact, given that there had been a lot of action before. Uh, and uh, we thought, OK, so we've done something. Something has happened. Now, why was it? Um, I think it's still very much under discussion. Uh, the central bankers like to think of it as the result of good monetary policy. It probably has something to do with it. Monetary policy definitely improved during that time. Uh, others think that maybe it was just luck. There were no big shocks, and basically that's the result. We basically didn't have much action in output. It's hard to know, but anyway, the whole discussion was we now basically have a good sense of fluctuations. We have uh, theoretical work, empirical work I've described. And in addition, the fluctuations have, have decreased. So the linear models, which kind of, again, well-behaved uh, models, work well. And that's where we were. Okay. Now, again, something about the provincialism of, of US economics which is this slide, which is that uh, yeah, it's absolutely true that there was, that the US economy looked more and more stable, more and more smooth. But anybody who knew history or had gone out of the US at some point <laughs> should have known that sometimes, somewhere, that was not the case, right? So, you know, we had the Great Depression. It happened. And clearly it was not smooth. And clearly strange things <coughs> happened then. But it was we thought was a long time ago and there had been policy mistakes would never happen again, right? So we dismissed it. Then there was, if you look at emerging markets, you look at Latin American countries, they went through, you know, periods of booms and busts and they kept going through it throughout the period. But again, this was dismissed as, well, these guys don't know what they are doing. Anyway, it's Latin America, it's not us. <laughs> so we don't have to worry the US or Europe are just much more stable. There was a bit a bit more worrisome example, which was sideways, which was Japan. And Japan basically since the 90s had been just going nowhere and policy didn't seem to work. And there was no slump and no, no growth and deflation. Uh, but again, the interpretation that we had was, well, these guys have made major policy mistakes. We're not going to do the same. We're safe. We have a great moderation, right? So. You know, I think all this was there. It just was not salient in our minds. 
the other thing is that I have blamed macroeconomists for not thinking about these things. There was at the border of macro uh, a field called corporate finance, uh, which at the time was very separate from macro, in which people were actually looking at nonlinearities and multiple equilibria. And there is an example that you probably all have seen uh, in, in, in your course or in real life. Uh, well, not in real life because I, th I think it hasn't happened during your time, but in books, which is backgrounds. And backgrounds is an example in which you have your money in a bank, you have your deposits in a bank, and you start thinking that maybe the bank is not solvent or not doing very well. And so you say, I better take my money out. And then the others say, well, if he's taking his money out, I better take my money out. Everybody takes their money out. The bank goes bust because it basically doesn't have funds, right? So this is clearly a case of multiple equilibria. Uh, so we knew it existed. But we thought, okay, so the solution to this has been found. It's deposit insurance. So that even if the bank goes bust, you're going to get your money. So you have no reason to be the first one in line at the bank. And indeed, this had prevented bank runs in the US. They were, you know, in the Great Depression, this was a major issue. But in the last 30 years, it, it was not. So we thought, yeah, it can happen. But again, that's kind of history or somewhere else. We don't have to worry about it. There was another discussion in which I was actually involved, uh, which is the zero lower bound on interest rates, the fact that interest rates to a first approximation cannot, no, cannot go negative. In the past few months, you know, some banks have been able to go slightly negative. But to a first approximation, when they become negative, it's attractive to hold cash. So you, basically, you can't, you can't go too far. And the idea was, well, what do we do if for some reason the central the economy needs a very low interest rate, maybe negative, and we can't get there. And this was discussed. This was discussed in the context of what is the inflation rate that we should have on average. And the conclusion was, well, it's not going to happen. And with a 2% inflation rate, we should be, so 2% inflation, that's a 4% nominal rate, 2% real, 2% inflation. We should be OK. And there were a lot of very serious papers with calibrations, mm -hmm. which basically said, don't worry, it will never happen. <laughs> so, okay. So somebody smarter than me would have realized all these things and would have accepted the job at the fund, knowing what could happen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but I was not smart enough. So, let me move on. Okay. So before I move to part two, one implication of not worrying about these things is actually that the sources of nonlinearities became stronger and stronger before the crisis. Uh, we didn't see it, but it was there. Uh, we basically got, and you'll see why I say this, we got closer to the dark corners. So when the crisis started, the nonlinearities were just where, there to kind of hit us. Uh, there was increased risk taking uh, by banks, there was increased leverage, so increased debt. Uh, by banks and by others. There was increased complexity of the financial system. So if you've read any book on the crisis, you know the complexity of the financing of a subprime. There's a fascinating graph. <laughs> this is not a transistor. <laughs> uh, it is a graph which was made by somebody at the uh, New York Fed, which is uh, the structure of shadow banking. So at one end, you have the savers who basically want to put their money somewhere. At the other end, you have the people taking mortgages, subprimes or others. And these are all the steps that the money goes through. And I'm not going to explain this slide. <laughs> but the visual impression is quite striking. You could have thought that maybe there would be one step in between people you know, putting their money in the bank and the bank making mortgages. This would be a one-step thing. It would be a very boring picture. Right. This is the picture as it was in 2008 or two, yeah, 2008. So complexity basically came in, and this was one of the sources of uh, problems. So part two is what are these nonlinear these nonlinearities? So there's a sense in which you, you, you 
you know, the, the quote about happy families are all the same and unhappy families are all different. It's a bit the same. Linearities, linear models are kind of all the same. Nonlinear models are different in many different ways. And that's true. So one looks for kind of a deep common explanation for nonlinearities. I'm not sure that there is. So I'm basically going through, uh, I'm going to go through those, which are uh, basically three and a half or four. Fiscal nonlinearities, financial nonlinearities, the interaction between the two fiscal nonlinearities and financial, and then the zero lower bound and inflation. Okay. I think these three are closely related. And it's the same idea behind it in different guys. Uh, this one, the last one, is quite different. Okay. So, fiscal nonlinearities, and I, uh, this is something that you must have, you know, been seen uh, described many times. Which is, suppose you have a government, uh, and which has bonds outstanding, and you start worrying. You're the investor, and you start worrying about the solvency, the ability of the government to actually repay the debt. Right. So what are you going to do? Well, you're willing to hold the bonds, but at a high interest rate, basically at a risk premium, right? Which reflects the probability that it may not be, uh, it, it may not be repaid. Okay. Now, when you do this, the government will have to pay more on the debt, right? Which means that the debt dynamics will get worse. And right? basically, for a given amount of debt, the debt will increase faster. Now, this will lead you to say, well, I was worried before, but now that debt dynamics are worse, I'm more worried. Right? So there's a higher chance that I'm not going to be paid, so you go back and you worry more about the solvency of the government, and so on and so on. Right? Now, the issue is, it may make sense to be worried about the solvency, and indeed it may be that the government really cannot pay you, and there are uh, places in the world uh, where this might well be relevant. The point is that this can happen even in the limit there was absolutely no reason to worry about solvency. If we all wake up and decide that the Portuguese government is in trouble and it's not going to repay us, until then the interest rate was low, nobody worried, but now the interest rate just jumps up, there's a big spread, right? Well, the Portuguese government is in trouble. So basically you can have multiple equilibria, we all wake up happy, liking the Portuguese government and nothing happens. Or we wake up worried about the po Portuguese government and we basically self-fulfill that worry by taking actions which basically make it impossible uh, for the government to, uh, to repay us. Right? So that's one form. Uh, it can take the form of a rollover risk, which is the government comes and has to refinance the debt and people go through the same reasoning, which is, well, it was good, but now we're not sure, so we're not going to basically lend you. And if the others are not lending, I don't lend either, and basically the government finds itself unable to roll over the debt. Uh, and a big part of uh, you know, management of the debt is the rollover, uh, rollover of debt, uh, which comes to maturity. And you can have certain stops, which is an extreme form of what I described, which is we wake up and we say, this government is just not going to do it, it's not going to make it, we don't lend. And then the government doesn't make it, because basically it doesn't have the money. So, this thing is a clear non-linearity. It can take mild forms, spreads, or it can take extreme forms, sudden stops in which the government just cannot, uh, cannot, cannot react. Okay. So I don't know how much time I'm going to spend on this. This is uh, a simulation which I did when I was at the farm to show that. It basically shows the equilibrium risk premium as a function of the ratio of debt to GDP. Right, so I start with 85% of GDP and I go to 94. Okay. So the green line is a, possible, a possibility, which is basically as long as the debt is not too high, so from 85 to 91, there is no risk. You're happy to basically lend to the government, no problem, no risk spread. At 91, 92, you start saying, well, there's a bit of a chance, right? And then in this case, actually, when the debt exceeds 93, there is no equilibrium, because basically you'd only be willing to lend at a rate which would make it impossible for the government to repay you, right? So in this case, there's just no way. So 
Beyond this, there's just no equilibrium, the government goes, uh, goes burst. Now, the red line <coughs> is actually the other equilibrium. And the other equilibrium always exists, right? So there are always multiple equilibria, even at 85%, which looks very safe here, right? Suppose that people say, no, 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 it's not safe at all, and we want a risk premium of 14%, right? Is it irrational? No because at the risk premium of 14%, you basically have put the government in a situation in which the cost of debt is so high that indeed asking for 14% risk premium is rational. That's an equilibrium, right? But it's very, very far away. So when the debt is relatively low, say at 85, nobody thinks about the red point. When you get to close to the end there, then people start thinking about, are we going to be in the green part or the red part? And that very easily, jump to the right part. So basically what happens, the point of this, is to say nonlinearities are always there, they are here, but they are really relevant only when you get to the situation where it could flip. And as you know, that's what happened uh, in, in Europe in particular, where the debt levels increased a lot at the beginning of the crisis. So I think I have a nice talk. Well, right. So I don't know if you've seen this slide, but CDS spreads are basically the indication of risk premium on, 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 on bonds. And as you can see, this is for different European countries, basically there was no risk premium until 2009. And then even during the financial crisis, there was not much. I mean, this, this is the intense part of the financial crisis in the US. Okay. But then there was the euro crisis. And the euro crisis was very much due to this was the idea that, well, these governments now have a lot of debt. Maybe they can't pay us, so we need a really high risk premium. And as you can see, uh, it went up a lot. I mean, you actually have two, I think you have two scales. Uh, you have a scale which is for all the countries except Greece. <laughs> and then you have the Greece scale there. And I'm not going to translate the CDS spreads in terms of risk premium and probability of default, but very, very high. So you can see how much of this was solvency, how much of this was liquidity, how much was it, if you want, fundamentals, and how much was it just a belief that things could go bad. It's very hard to tell, but a very large part of this was multiple equilibrium, right? So when Mario Draghi, who is the head of the uh, European Central Bank, said, I'm going to do everything it takes to basically make sure the spreads don't get too high, then people said, well, he has eliminated the bad equilibrium and the spreads basically didn't fall completely, but they went down a whole lot. So basically by his words, but only by his words, because he never spent a penny on that program, right? he was able to convince people to move from the red equilibrium to the green equilibrium. And uh, let's hope that he can continue to do so, which is an open issue at this point. Uh, Financial nonlinearity. So it's very much the same. It's the idea that you know, you're dealing, say, with a bank, and you worry. And so but the form that it's going to take is a bit different. Right? For the government, it was higher spreads. You basically say, I'm willing to uh, to lend to you, but at the rate which is higher than uh, than the safe rate. In the case of a bank, typically you have a deposit there, and it pays very little. And you can't say, well, I'm going to stay if you increase my deposit rate by X. That's not the way it works, right? But what you can do is take your money out, right? And that's, again, the, the bank rent story. So what you have in the case of banks, but other financial institutions, is you have deposit runs. Basically, people take their money out because better save than sorry. You're not sure that the bank is really solvent. Prefer to be the first one out before the money has run out. So you do this. So the bank suddenly finds itself with a much smaller deposit base, right? And it has to sell stuff in order to pay you. Okay. Well, a typical bank or a typical financial intermediary will have assets which are harder to sell than the liabilities, right? So you could take your money out right away, but on the other side, you know, the bank has a loan or is making loans. It's very hard to actually kind of call the loan overnight and say, sorry, guys, you have to pay. So what happens is that the bank will have to sell whatever it has on the asset side of its balance sheet at prices which are very low because it really needs the money. So these are called fire sales, right? Now, this doesn't reassure you in the slightest because now, if you thought the bank was in trouble before, 
Now it has liquidated its assets at prices which are much below what they could have been because they had to sell it, they had, it had to sell it, and therefore you take your money out even more, and you can see the end. There is no bank at the end, right? The bank has gone bankrupt. And so what we learned in the crisis, so this is very much a story of bankruptcy, but what we learned in the crisis is that that can happen not just to banks, but ne nearly to any financial institution, including those for which there is no deposit insurance, right? If you basically have a financial institution which take very short-term uh, borrows on a very short-term basis and then makes long-term loans or buy long bonds, then it's going to be in that position. And so we realized that the whole financial system was basically exposed to this. And deposit insurance just covered the banks, not the shadow banking system, not the rest of the, of the financial system. So same thing for banks and for the state, which is this could happen even if there was absolutely no reason to worry, objective reason to worry about the state of a bank, right? This is what happens in some movies. Uh, basically, people kind of, for some reason, just want their money out and then you go and you do it, right? So liquidity, this liquidity issue can happen e even if a bank is solvent. If it, if it is insolvent, then clearly this is going to happen. But even if it's solvent, again, you have to equilibria. You have a one where people are relatively satisfied with the bank and they don't take their money out. And the other one, and you know which one prevails depends on whims. On uh, typically the two are related. I mean, it's rare that there'll be a run without any news about the solvency of the bank. But there has to be something which says, well, maybe the bank. You know, some article in the Financial Times saying maybe the bank is not the last loan or the last project was not very good, and then it will start. So liquidity will just build on uh, on the solvency issue. Okay. Now, in that context, you can see what's going to happen if the system is opaque, complex, and interconnected. And basically, if you don't know the value, I mean, if you're basically dealing with an entity and you don't understand the balance sheet or you don't understand who it's dealing with, then at the first indication that there's something wrong, you're going to run away. So, for example, when Lehman happened, then immediately everybody, you know, they, the people, investors looked at all the other institutions and said, well, I don't understand what they do, it's much too complex. Let me take my money out and put it in government bonds, right? So the more opaque the system, and it was incredibly opaque because of the structure, you know, the shadow banking slide I showed you, right? The, uh, the more it's likely to happen, and that indeed is, is, is what happened. Uh, the other thing is also, when things get, it's a different point, when things get bad, in normal times when you deal with, say, Chris, all I need to know, yeah, no, no, uh, <laughs> I, I know nothing special. When I deal with, uh, with Chris, you know, I, he's a good guy, I can lend him money, and all I need to know is how Chris has behaved in the past, and that's good enough. When the situation is, is, is worse, then I need to know more. I need to know who Chris is dealing with because Chris is a good guy, but if he's dealing with somebody that is not a good guy, then Chris is in trouble. Well, Chris is a very good guy. Right? <laughs> uh, so the chains basically complicate things, and that's a very nice point. There was a very nice uh, article uh, by Ricardo Cavalio at MIT, which basically said, in normal times, you just look at your counterparties, but when things become rough, you have to look at the counterparties of your counterparties of your counterparties because that's whether you're going to be paid or not, depends on the whole chain. And the system had become so complex, basically, that there was generalized uh, mistrust of anybody you dealt with. So most financial transactions stop with all the effects that, that I've talked about. Let me see what I have here. Okay. So that's another graph which I'm not going to explain in great <laughs> detail. But this was constructed, by, again, by somebody at the, at the fund, and it shows the interconnections between various financial institutions. And these are syndicated loans across banks. So, and you can see how, when you start worrying about this, you have to worry about all the counterparties that the Société Générale is dealing with. And in an environment like the one we had, uh, this led to, again, uh, not trusting anybody, the so-called interbank market in which banks lend to each other 
uh, without collateral basically stopped. Nobody wanted to lend to anybody else. And you got all kinds of uh, financial institutions having to basically liquidate assets at very low prices, which made things worse. So. Okay. So I've talked about the, the fiscal uh, nonlinearities. I've talked about the financial nonlinearities. Well, what happened in Europe was that they nicely combined to make things even worse. <laughs> so the name here, I mean, we've been fairly creative about the uh, names. So in the literature, they have been called the diabolical loops or the doom loops or the deadly embrace. And it's basically the interaction between the two mechanisms that I've talked about. Right? So suppose that you stop worrying about uh, whether the state is going to be able to repay. Now, this is going to lead you to worry about the banks. Why? Because banks hold a lot of government bonds. So if you start having doubts about the value of government bonds, you have doubts about the assets of the banks, and therefore you worry about the banks. Right. So now you worry about the banks, right? Well, this makes you worry about the government, because if banks go under, there's a good chance that the government has to come back and recapitalize them, which means from a fiscal point of view, is going to be difficult. So there's a good chance that the government will be unable to actually pay. And so you can see how these interact. You worry about banks, this makes you worry about the government, this makes you worry about the banks because they hold government bonds, which makes you worry about the state, and so on and so on. And this played uh, a very major role uh, in the euro crisis. And again, it's a non-linearity. You can see how that multiple equilibria again, potentially. So I think there's a nice graph here, yes. This is fairly nice. So this is uh, the spreads. So think of it as risk premia. These are CDS spreads. But think of it as, as risk premia in Ireland uh, for the uh, banks and for the state. So the southern the state. Okay. So if it starts like this okay, in 2007 until basically October, start worrying about the banks. It looks like the banks are not doing very well. So the uh, spread on the spread on the on the banks increases. Say it's kind of okay, right? Then what happens on September 30th is that under strong pressure from the ECB, the state bails out the banks. So basically, it recap it promises to recapitalize the banks. And basically, well, this is very good for the banks, which are now in much better shape. But it means that the fiscal situation of a state is not so good because now it has taken <coughs> this enormous amount of, 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 of debt on board. Right? So what you have is rate goes down, which is what you would expect. The risk spread on the banks goes down. Okay? And the risk spread on the government starts increasing. Right? And then from now on, you see how they both move together. And this is because, indeed, there is a deadly embrace. Right? Basically, what happens to the banks affects the government. What happens to the government affects to the bank, affects the banks, and therefore they move together, and you get again um, very, very high uh, spreads at some point. Then again, quite down, and today it's very quiet. But that shows again the interaction between the two, and uh, and the issues that the Irish were uh, confronted with. So I've talked about three nonlinearities, fiscal, financial, fiscal and financial. So this is a different one, right? And this is something that, again, you probably have uh, been exposed to, which is the, the fact that there is a flow uh, to uh, nominal interest rates. And again, and we've learned that you can go to maybe minus one, but you can't go to minus five. At minus five, people basically keep cash at home. Uh, or banks start offering safes with cash in it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, smart people find ways, basically. So let's, let's assume it's zero or minus one, doesn't matter, right? So what happens? You have an economy in which there is a major decrease in demand and output. So you have a big, big recession. And you started with not much inflation. And so inflation decreases. This is you know, a Phillips curve or something like this, which basically says if the economy is doing poorly, inflation will decrease. And we get to deflation, right? So the economy is now you know, very high unemployment, large 
output gap and deflation, right? You've decreased the interest rate as strongly as you could. Now it's zero, okay, but you can't do more. Okay, but what happens, basically, if there is deflation, this means that the real interest rate, the interest rate in terms of goods, becomes positive, right? If deflation is 10% and you have a 0% zero zero nominal rate, then it's as if you, uh, you're basically paying a 10% real rate, right? So what happens is you get deflation, you get higher real interest rates. Well, that, that makes things worse, right? Because higher real interest rate will further decrease demand, further decrease activity, which will lead to further deflation, which will lead to higher real interest rates, and so on and so on. Now, there is a version of this, which is called the deflation spiral, which can be extremely scary. And actually, we saw it in the Great Depression. I didn't see it, but people at the time saw it. <laughs> uh, which is that it becomes worse and worse. So you start with small deflation, then larger deflation, and then it keeps going. And in the Great Depression, I mean, deflation reached minus 10% a year at some point. So, you know, real interest rates were very high. We've been very lucky in the sense that for other reasons, uh, it looks as if we can have deflation. We've had deflation right? briefly in the US, a bit more in Europe, a bit more in Japan. But it seems to go and stop at minus 1, minus 2. It doesn't seem to be, you know, going from minus 2 to minus 4 to minus 10. And so, one reason, and this is being discussed by economics, is inflation expectations are very anchored. And so, basically, there is pressure down on inflation, but it doesn't accumulate over time. Okay. But it's still an extremely unpleasant situation, because basically, you are in this deflation trap. What do you do? You can't use monetary policy, fiscal policy, for various reasons, because it was used a lot at the beginning of a crisis. It's not easy to use, and things can basically remain very bad. You just cannot use anything. So again, if you could suddenly have inflation, somehow, then that would change the dynamics completely, right? The real interest rate would become negative again. This would lead, in, this would lead people to spend more. You could basically uh, increase uh, activity, increase output. But once you're in that trap, it's very, very hard to get out. And what we have learned is Japan has been in that trap now for more or less off and on for 20 years and still hasn't found the way out. Uh, they tried fiscal too much, uh, it didn't work, uh, and on monetary policy they are trying desperately to do everything they can, but they, they now have positive inflation, but very low one, and they are not out of the woods. So this is another type of non-linearity, it's a lower bound, it's a zero bound, and that has uh, a bad effect. Okay, so last part is where do we go from here? probably going to go fast here because this is more aimed at people doing research. But I think that we have, and there's something which is always true, we should be very humble <laughs> because the world is a much more complex place than what we thought in 2008. Each of these non-linearities, I've described them simply, but you know, understanding exactly what they are, how you can prevent them, uh, is, is, is quite difficult. So I think this a research program in macro, which is to build big malls in which we basically put everything in and we hope are going to work. I think given the importance of these mechanisms, uh, it's probably a bit too ambitious. That basically we have to understand these nonlinearities. And as I say, I think there is work going on. I mean, you know, one way of looking at it is to look at the NBR working papers. And there is a lot of work on the, as you've seen, what is very important, which is the intersection between uh, macroeconomics and finance, where clearly all the things are, are happening. So there are a lot of papers on that. I think there's a great deal of progress, but I think, again, we should be uh, more, uh, less ambitious in terms of formalization. Let me probably move to that slide. Uh, which is the last one. So, uh, in terms of policy, which is most important at this point, I think there are two lessons. The first one is, it's very hard to get out of dark corners, and so you should really avoid them at all costs. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I had a joke in the corresponding papers in which I say we go from dark corners to black holes. <laughs> uh, 
black holes you don't get out. As far as, as, far as I know, at least for the moment, we, we don't know how to get out of black holes. Okay. Dark corners you can, but it's very tough. And we've seen, you know, for example, Japan is still trying to, uh, and we had to do very dramatic things in order to get out of the other ones. And not, not clear that we are. So what do we do? So I would, I would start with that, which is, you know, I've shown the mechanisms uh, for which uh, financial uh, nonlinearities come. And they have a lot to do with the maturity of the asset side and the liability side. If you're an institution which has very short-term liabilities and long-term assets, you're potentially in more trouble, so you can put restrictions on the degree of mismatch maturity that you want. Also, when you do fire sales and you lose money, uh, you're going to go under if you don't have enough capital, so another dimension in which you can do something, and Chris has been working, I think, on these things, uh, is you can actually can require banks or other institutions to have enough capital to be ready in case there is a shock, they can basically handle it. So you can do a lot of financial uh, regulation. You can use what's known as macroprudential tools, which are basically when you see part of the economy getting dangerously close to a dark corner, you can basically ask them to be more careful by asking them to uh, decrease leverage or something like this, or increase capital. So I think that's terribly important. There's an enormous amount of work there. Whether it's completely successful and the financial system is so complex that simple rules are too simple and too complicated rules lead to the emergence of smart lawyers who find ways around them. Uh, so there's enormous progress, I think there's no question that we're further away from dark corners than we were uh, in 2007, but they still exist and they're not there before. The second is, with respect to the fiscal loop, it's fairly obvious, they have very low levels of debt, right? But it's a bit difficult given where we are today. I mean, in many countries, you know, the, the ratio of debt to GDP varies between 80% and in Japan, 250%, right? And so, yes, it would be good if we were in another world in which debt to GDP ratios were low, but it's going to take a while to get there. So again, here, the idea is, well, don't rock the boat, but it's going to take a long time before you get to a place where the uh, non-linearities are relevant. The ZLB and the optimal rate of inflation, this is something that uh, I have worked on and Larry has worked on and various people have worked on, which is again, the way to avoid the zero bound is to start with relatively high interest rates before the shock, right? If the interest rate is say uh, 6%, right, then you can decrease it to zero. You have 600 basis points of 6% that you can go and you can use it. If the interest rate starts at 4 you have much less room. So again, the advice for the future is maybe you should try to get average interest rates to be higher. How do you do this? The nominal rate is the sum of the real, is the sum of the real interest rate and expected inflation. So what this says is maybe you should run a rate of inflation higher than the current target of the central banks. The current target of the central banks is about 2%, and I've argued that they should probably go to 4%. They went to 4% with a real interest rate of 2%, then we would be at 6% on average, which means that when the shock comes, we would have more room and we would avoid the, uh, the, the, the deflation trap. Again, this is very nice advice, except that that's not where we are. So the first order of business, which we may get to a bit faster than here, is to basically let inflation first get back to 2%, but it's not yet and then have a discussion about whether we should increase it to 4%. So for a while, this and this are going to imply that the dark corners are not very far. The zero lower bound issue can really come back, and the uh, high debt uh, is going to be an issue uh, in a number of European countries, is my guess, in the not too distant future. It has a number of implications, which you probably have read about, about current monetary policy. So in normal times, if you were very far away from the zero lower bound, you'd basically choose the interest rate, which makes the economy go back to potential. And 
to choose it. Now, in this case, you may actually want to be a bit more careful because the cost of missing is not the same. Basically, if the economy is weaker than you thought, you don't have, you don't have an instrument, you're going to be stuck, where if it's too strong, you can always increase the interest rate. So this is leading to a discussion as to whether the Fed should basically be more careful on the interest rate because it's so close to where it couldn't do anything if there was an adverse shock. Or it should basically ignore that. And that's part of the discussion. Looks like the, looks like the end. <laughs> uh, so, in short, I think we're now close to, and we're out of dark corners, I think, for the most part. Uh, and we can think of, in the small, the economy is being more or less linear. Uh, but we have to be very careful about not getting to the wrong places. And again, macroprudential fiscal money uh, have to be thought of uh, in order to avoid getting close to where it's dark and dangerous. Let me stop here, take questions. Who would like to be first? Thank you, Professor, for coming here. Question is, as a policymaker, during a crisis, your your job is to reassure people that everything is going to be okay, and you take and you take measure to make sure that people see that it's going to be okay. But what happens post when you're in the recovery? You've taken all these extreme measures during the crisis. And now you're going to see these ripples that trickles later on. Like, what happens when, is there always a, um, a fear that perhaps in saving the economy, you may have just cured the patient to death? So the question is whether like how you you know, some, some of the measures that have been taken uh, are, in the longer run, uh, counterproductive. I would say that measures which have been taken surely have some unpleasant implications for the future. That doesn't mean they should not have been taken. So for example, I think that we have much higher levels of debt uh, than, uh, than we had before the crisis. But at the same time, I have no doubt that the fiscal expansion in 2009, which is one of the contributors to that, uh, was absolutely essential. Uh, another example, which is being very much discussed, is the, uh, the effect of low interest rates on risk taking. There is this argument that low interest rates need some investors to take more risk because they really want to get 5% and they can get 5% by being reasonable, so they, they do crazy stuff in order to get 5%. I think the empirical evidence is mixed on this, but even if it's true, it's one of the side effects of a good policy. So. It has to be taken into account, but in my book, this is not important enough not to do it. Now, there are people, for example, at the BIS, at the Bank of International Settlements, who have a different view. They don't believe that monetary policy affects the economy through the interest rate, and they think that it affects risk in a big way. So these people would say, you should not have done it. But I personally think you should have. There's another example in the press this week, Mr. Schauble. Minister of Finance of Germany has accused the, uh, uh, Mario Draghi, who is uh, in charge of the ECB, of killing the uh, German savers. Now, it's, it's partly true in the sense that the interest rate on non German bonds is more or less zero, and if you are living on the interest rate income, you're not doing very well. That's a side effect, that's not good. Should it have prevented the ECB from decreasing interest rates? No, because we think that on net low interest rates were needed to help total demand. But it has distribution effects. So I think we have to be realistic uh, about the fact that some policies have adverse implications. What would be very bad would be to, to put a band-aid on something and let it fester underneath. So measures which basically solve a problem in the short run, but make it worse later, uh, then that's very bad. Right? But I, I don't think that has been a, a major issue.
Thank you. Uh, you spent, uh, you, you skipped a few slides there that I think had uh, <laughs> but not uh, fast something enough. to do with the, uh, <laughs> no, I was actually very interested I, that I, what I think deal with um, modeling tools and techniques to look at the nonlinearities uh, you're talking about. Do you mind spending a couple minutes talking about those <laughs> tools and techniques for addressing us? So I think these are probably the slides that uh, that you have in mind. So, both in terms of of policy and research, I think what what we have to do is look for the dark corners. You know, we can think of what happened in two thousand and eight, not having looked, and then having just fallen into them, right? So, basically, what we can do. So, all this is happening, and uh, again, there's a lot of very good uh, very good research work. You basically, we know, for example, that housing booms are very, very dangerous. And the reason they're dangerous is not so much that the price of housing goes up and then down, is that people borrow a lot to buy houses, and when the price goes down, many of them you know, have more debt than the value of a house or cannot make interest payments if there's a recession. So there has been a lot of work on trying to see what is a dangerous housing boom. You know, when, when is it statistically looking at the data of the past housing booms, what is it followed by? If prices go up by more than 30% in a year, what's the probability that something bad happens? So I think we're getting a better sense of these things. Same thing for credit booms. Right? And basically, you see large credit booms. Some of them may be healthy. You know, basically, you're able to provide credit to people who didn't have access but should have, which case it's good, or it can be very unhealthy, which basically the credit is given to people with absolutely no chance of of playing back, right? So some of the subprime stuff. So there's a lot of work on basically looking at the after effects of credit boom. So that's one way. The other is that you can basically look at the things we've learned are important, which is the leverage of the various financial institutions, basically how much debt they have. So because if the value of the assets goes down, you know, at some stage, it's worth less than their debt, and then they're uh, gone. So, you know, I think something which is very promising is a stress test, which now have been put in place uh, by the major uh, central banks in the US, in Europe. I don't know about Japan, I don't think so yet. But, and basically what this does is give, we give banks scenarios. We say, take your balance sheet, the housing market uh, has decreased by 20%, the economy has 10% unemployment, uh, 30% of your loans are non-performing. Uh, you were holding uh, Japanese bonds. They have gone down in value. So we give them, you know, basically bad scenarios, and we look at whether under those scenarios they can survive. They have enough capital, right? And so this, you can see how complex the task it is, but it is, I think, uh, it is done, and it's done better and better. So we get a better sense. It forces the banks themselves or the institutions themselves to actually think about the risk. Uh, there is a lot of gaming involved. They don't want to show that they are going to be in trouble. So there is a question of how do they do the computation uh, which they are required to do, how do they assess risk. But I think there is great progress. So this is happening. And then on the next slide, yeah, this is some of, just to give you a sense, I mean, there is an enormous amount of work on trying to measure these very fuzzy notions called systemic risks. Right? and to try to give early warnings, which is to try to say, well, the part is something bad happens, is X. So the, uh, this, is this was created because of the crisis, right? The U.S. Office of Financial Research uh, basically uses all kinds of methods to look at how far we are from dark corners. And there's a lot of uh, very interesting work. It gives you a sense of these are the slides you wanted to see. Yeah, I think <laughs> I have a few more in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on the monetary policy side of things, you mentioned you favor uh, an inflation target, 4%. And um, I've, I've read a lot about nominal GDP targeting. And I'm wondering do you think the obsession with interest rate targeting 
among central banks will ever inflation. change. Inflation target. Well, well, currently, in interest rate targeting, what they're doing, some some central banks. Um, they don't do interest targeting. But they do forward guidance. They say what they are likely to do with the interest rate. It's not a target. Oh, okay. Well, 4%, 2%. Where do you think um, novelty targeting sits in there? Um, I think that gets rather technical what target you use. Uh, there are some arguments for using nominal GDP targeting. Uh, there is a political argument, which is not the one usually made, I think it's one which is whatever, which is if, if you announce, suppose that we want to move. So now the Fed has established credibility with a 2% inflation target, right? If Janet Yellen was to come tomorrow and say, well, I've slept badly, and I now think it should be 4%, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to be in the markets that day. <laughs> right? I mean, the, the whole financial community would say it's completely irresponsible. That you can fuzz this by talking about a nominal income. Targeting, which is basically the inflation rate plus the growth rate. And it might be easier, just from a political point of view, this is not a big point, right, to actually announce a nominal income target of 5 or 6 percent. It would be sufficiently confusing to people <laughs> that it might work better. There are some more sophisticated arguments, but I think that's. Uh, otherwise, I don't think the exact target, I mean, get into the entrails of monetary policy, but I don't think that the exact target matters very much, whether it's nominal income or inflation. They have slightly different properties. But Thank you. That was, uh, that was excellent. So um, you did uh, you had some very good examples looking backwards. And so right now in financial markets, the huge debate going on on China and uh, about their banking system and how undercapitalized it is, also about how much debt um, in the local governments and the private sector might eventually feed back to the government and then added on a concern about the currency. And so it makes it a little bit different from, um, um, from, from other things. And so I wonder how you'd apply that framework and think about China and uh, whether they have dangers of getting into a doom loop or whether there is in control that they say they are. So I think there is no risk of a doom loop because the fiscal position is so different from the fiscal position of the countries I was referring to, in the sense that even if uh, the banks or the shadow banks get in trouble because of bad loans, which they do have, uh, the fiscal cost basically can be absorbed without raising questions about the sustainability of government debt. Uh, to give you back of the envelope numbers, so local government debt is already basically, you know, local government debt is already debt. So it's uh, the important thing is corporate debt, which is about 100% of GDP. The estimates that I've seen from people that I trust is that non-performing loans are about 15% of total loans, right? So that's 15% of GDP. But the recovery value is, not, is positive. It's about 50%. So that gives you 7.5% of GDP. 7.5% of GDP can be absorbed by the Chinese government without thinking. So the doom loop, you have only half of the loop. You don't have the other one, which is that even if they decide to fully recapitalize <coughs> the banks which need to be recapitalized, it's not going to put them in a dangerous position. Now, if they wait, then we get kind of a Japanese scenario in which they let zombie firms continue and non-performing loans increase, then it may become an issue. But I think as of today, I would say it's not. And, and what if the, uh, their failure to alleviate concerns leads to capital outflows that makes them lose control of the currency and you get sort of a different type of doom loop on emerging markets and other things? That concern you? There is, and this is another possibility, although that's not that's not one which kind of self fulfills. I mean, what what can happen? I don't think it's going to for reasons we can discuss. But 
you know, suppose that the foreign investors become very worried about China and take their money out, or suppose that the Chinese investors uh, take their money out, as you know, they, each of them can do it up to 50,000. So if you multiply this by 1 billion four, it's a lot of money, which can do it. The, uh, what we, this would lead to would be a sharp depreciation of the RMB. A sharp depreciation is actually a good thing. For China, but for not China. for the rest of the world. For China. Yeah. Yeah. for China. So for China, it would help. Right? This is one of the mechanisms which work the right way, which is when people mm -hmm. get worried, they do something which actually makes things better. Right? So, I'm not. But I think depreciation could happen. I, I don't think it's the most likely outcome, but surely it's one. Perhaps just to follow up on his question, one of the reasons why I think we were able to stay away from the dark corner or come back from the dark corner is the debt to GDP ratio was is unusually high and still is. If China uh, stops buying the debt or starts selling debt, and Saudi Arabia uh, saying the same thing, do you think it's possible to go closer to the dark corners again? No, again, I think that. Uh for the most part, this would be good. And this would lead, you know, if Saudi Arabia made good on one of the fights that they have made and, and sold, I think this would lead to a depreciation of the dollar, right? Uh, it might lead to some increase in the rate on some bonds, obviously, but it will lead to a depreciation of the dollar, which is a good thing uh, from the point of view of activity. So I think it's a bit of an empty threat. Uh, and I think the short run effects, at least, would be would be rather good. Hola. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Okay, I have a question that's uh, something completely uh, different, which is just your personal opinion. Considering the last financial crisis, as opposed to everything I said before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, let's see see what the question is. Um, you know, the last recession affected a lot of people's lives. People lost jobs, they became homeless, yeah. uh, it caused mental health illnesses to people. Do you mm -hmm. think there should be more criminal charges brought against certain financiers, um, economists, bankers? Because in other professions, if you affect someone negatively, then there are legal repercussions against you. But it seems to people in the world right now that, you know, you can gamble away people's lives, but nothing, you're untouchable. So, I surely agree with the cost of the crisis, and I think that you know when you think in terms of GDP, it's too abstract. It's really people's lives, and unemployment went to ten percent. Now, should you, uh, you know, should you, you know, sue the, the bankers? The question is, you know, why did they did they break the law? Um, I think. It, Surely some did, uh, but in general, I thought they, I think they, they thought they were playing within, you know, the legal constraints. And so in this case, we should make sure that the legal constraints are different in the future. But it's difficult to indict them. At the same time, you know, so this is kind of a serious answer. But my emotional answer is, you know, as I see the Panama Papers, which you follow, mm -hmm. is to be very mad. <laughs> and to think that the rich really uh, uh, have too much influence on the on the political process, that the banks have too much influence for lobbying, I, that I think is correct. But putting people in jail, if, it, if they did something criminal, they should. But if they just got greedy within legal uh, limits, no. Right. So would you um, be advocating for changing the regulation. Oh, absolutely. That's good. Thank, you. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. Uh, my question is more about uh, communication with policymakers. I think Paul Krugman uh, once noted that policymakers can sometimes see the difference between nominal interest rates as a wonkish detail that you don't need to observe. So whenever you're communicating some of these more complicated models and mathematics to policymakers, how do you try and do that on a level that uh, is fully uh, reflective of what the model is actually uh, outputting? And then how do you, whenever you're communicating to the general public, which is also an even, you know, uh, presumably less informed level, communicate, this is a good idea and this is uh, 
the best possible option for the economy. So how do you kind of distill that down? Uh, you'll be the judge. I, I try to distill things to a very high level of this audience, but uh, I think I could do it at a, to a lower level audience. But it, it's a no, it is difficult uh, because very often policymakers, uh, not so, I mean, the, the governors, are t governors of central banks typically have some knowledge of economics. Uh, <laughs> the ministers of finance, not always, but sometimes. <laughs> but prime ministers don't. Uh, and so you have to you have to think really hard about communication, uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But what I found when I was uh, at the IMF is most of the time they will not really listen, but they'll hear something at one point which will they'll which will resonate. And then if you see their eyes open, then you just <laughs> go for it. Uh, <laughs> But it's yeah, it's a bit like teaching undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you once again, Professor. Good. Thank you.